So I'm just going to give you a very brief summary of CHPC's Building Envelope Conundrum Study. Uh, it was written by Mark Ginsberg, the president of CHPC, and myself, Sarah Watson, um, along with a lot of support from architects on our board and our zoning committee. So what is the building envelope? So in contextual districts in New York City, there are rules dictating the three dimensions of any new building that goes up. And these rules cover many aspects of a new building. For example, there are rules dictating the dimensions for how much a building can set back from the street or how much it can set back from the rear of the lot. There are rules dictating the maximum height for a building in contextual districts. There are rules dictating the maximum base height that is the height of the front of the building before the setbacks kick in. There are rules on lot coverage, how much of the lot the building can take up. There are rules dictating courts and how many courts and what the dimensions of those courts can be for a new building. There are rules about how much of a rear yard and a side yard the building has to include. And there are also rules dictating the distance between neighboring buildings. So all of these dimensional rules come together to form the permitted building envelope for a new building within a contextual district. So what is the conundrum of the building envelope? So we had heard from many architects on our board that in recent years, they were finding that these dimensions, the building envelope dimensions that are set, were actually being reached before all the floor area for a site had been used. So there are two different rules for a site in a contextual district. You have to apply the limits on the floor area that you can build, but also these three dimensional rules. And they had felt that the three dimensional rules were being maximized, but there was still floor area permitted for that site that could have been built. So this means that less floor area than under the current zon zoning rules um, was able to be built. So we really wanted to find a way to test this hypothesis. So we conducted a case study. Uh, we took 17 projects from a number of architects on our board, some recent projects they'd worked on. And we calculated all of the building envelope dimensions for those projects through from the technical drawings. We also calculated the total permitted floor area for that site. So that is the general floor area that's allowed for the zoning district, plus any floor area bonuses that the project was eligible for, minus any deductions, that is parts of the building that do not have to go towards the calculation for floor area. So the key result from this analysis is that out of the 17 projects that we looked at, eight of those 17 did leave floor area unbuilt. That is the floor area that was already permitted for that site was left unbuilt because of the building envelope dimensions. So the maximum three dimensions for the building were met and the floor area that was permitted for that site could not fit within those dimensions. Out of those eight projects, over 56,000 square foot of potential permitted floor area was left unbuilt because of the envelope dimensions. And that's 56,000 square foot that could have been potential apartments um, built under the current zoning rules for floor area. So we were very interested in trying to understand why this was happening um, in recent years. So we went back to the original assumptions that were used to set the dimensions um, in 1987 for contextual zoning. And we found that the answer really was that things have changed a lot for residential buildings since the 80s. And this is why we're seeing this conundrum. One example is that um, today we have higher floor to floor heights in apartment buildings than in the 1980s. In general, the average um, floor to floor height for a new building in the 1980s was about eight foot eight. That is a eight foot floor to ceiling and then eight inches between the ceiling and the floor above. Now our average is about nine foot four. We want higher ceiling heights today. And also there's more things to fit between a ceiling and a floor than in the 80s. For example, 
new sprinkler requirements that are enforced in new buildings. On top of that, if you're building modular construction, in general, you need about a 10 foot one floor to floor height um, because modules need more gap between um, each ceiling and each floor. So this is the impact of those floor to floor ceiling height differences. So in the 1987, if you have a height limit, the assumption is that you could fit 11 stories into that limit. Now, if you look at the current floor to floor heights, um, by adding that extra height for each story, you actually miss a whole story off if you maintain that height limit. If you're doing modular construction, you'd actually miss two whole stories off if you're maintaining that height limit. So you're literally able to build less floor area for your building, less apartments. Another example of things that have changed for residential buildings since the 80s is that construction materials and techniques have changed that favor different dimensions. So a good example of this is block and plank construction, which is a, a newer construction system that's often used um, for affordable housing in New York as it's deemed more cost effective as a system than poured in place concrete. Now the original dimensions for the building envelope assumed that a building would have a depth of 65 foot, but this does not really suit block and plank construction. A plank spans about 30 foot, so ideally you want a depth that falls in a multiple of 30 foot. So you would use two bays to get you 60 foot. But with the other dimensions don't adjust accordingly to this loss of depth, you have less space internally in the building to fit floor area. Also today, we're building more and more on irregular sized lots as we have less developable land in New York City. The original dimensions were established based on the idea of a very standard rectangular lot, um, of which there are far less today. If you apply those dimensions then onto an irregular lot, it becomes very complicated, far more, more difficult to apply, um, and actually renders a lot of irregular lots impossible to build on. And finally, we do use extra floor area now as an incentive for many public policy goals, um, such as for energy efficiency. If you put thicker walls into a new building, you can deduct that thickness from your floor area calculation. Bicycle parking, you can deduct from your calculation. If you're going through the voluntary inclusionary housing program, you will get extra floor area if you put in affordable housing in your building. So often extra floor area bonuses and deductions are used a lot to achieve certain public policy goals that are deemed very important for residential buildings. And this is harder and harder to fit into the building envelope where the dimensions stay the same. So what could be done to solve this conundrum? Well, we really believe that the dimensions that are set in contextual zones just need to be updated to reflect the new values for residential buildings today. We believe that the concept of contextual zoning and setting the limits for a new building should stay in existence, but each element could be revisited um, in order to add a little flexibility on the envelope, and that is in setbacks, in height, in base height, court requirements, yard requirements, and lot coverage. If you have any additional questions about the building envelope conundrum study, please contact Sarah Watson, swatson at chpcny.org.